Well, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Greg Michalowski. It's Monday, uh, July 7th, 2014, uh, and we are after the uh, U.S. jobs report and also after the, after the ECB meeting from last week. Uh, last week. Uh, what am I thinking now? Uh, do we have a calm or do we have a further storm? That's a, that's a title that I uh, thought we'd uh, talk about uh, trading in the uh, webinar here today at FX Street. I want to thank the people at FX Street for allowing me to uh, participate in this uh, webinar. And uh, it's not often that I, I have a Monday uh, session, so uh, I thought maybe we would uh, take a look at uh, what happened last week uh, briefly, and then uh, take a look at the uh, market now and see see what uh, what may lie ahead. We are also at a key uh, point uh, here, or I think a key. Uh, re rebirth, if you will. Uh, half the year is now done, uh, and uh, we are in the uh, month of July. Uh, admittedly, we have we still have a few more games to play at the World Cup to get through, and then the uh, summer season. But uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens in the second half of the year, and maybe maybe look at the first half a little bit. Or what I'm going to do is look at the first half a little bit and uh, make some uh, judgments as far as. Maybe what we might expect in the second half. All right, before we get started, let me remind everybody that trading foreign exchange carries a high level of risk that may not be suitable for all investors in addition to that. Leverage creates additional risk and loss exposure should you decide to trade foreign exchange. Carefully consider your investment objectives, your experience level, your risk tolerance. You can lose all or part of your risk cap on the foreign exchange market, so be aware and be prepared. Who am I? Well, I'm that guy on the right there. I've uh, been working in the financial markets now for 28 years, 15 of those years, we're in the institutional market as an interest rate trader for Citibank and Credit Suisse First Boston. Spent 13 years with FXDD. The first six, seven years was mainly focused on the risk management side, on the risk management side. Uh, so managing the uh, overall uh, exposure uh, for FXDD. Over the last five or six years, I've been with you as a uh, for an, a Forex analysis uh, analyst, analysis analyst. Uh, and, uh, uh, and during that time, I also authored a book called Attacking Currency Trends. If you d haven't read it, you want to read it, you want to learn more about it, uh, go to attackingcurrencytrends.com or on Amazon, uh, amazon.com. You can find out information about it there. Uh, it is uh, one of the highest ranking books, uh, foreign, foreign exchange uh, trading books that you'll find on amazon.com. And you can read the reviews there and the good and the bad. Uh, anyway. Uh, now, now, um, on my own, I'm going on my own. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I left uh, FXDD after those uh, 13 years, starting my own Forex uh, consulting firm called Greg and Mike FX. Of course, uh, those people who follow me, that's my Twitter handle and uh, sort of my my brand, my name, my, my, my you know, it's, it's easier than Greg Michalowski FX. Um, so um, I thought maybe we'd keep it the same. My uh, game plan uh, at Greg Mike FX is to uh, bring what I've accumulated over the last 28 years, throwing away the bad, keeping the good, and packaging it up for you, taking you on your journey uh, from uh, what you should be uh, as a trader um, starting off, or or how you should how you should uh, function as a trader, and uh, and to where where you should um, be uh, today, um, and uh, hopefully along the, that uh, you know the plans for this new venture for this new um, period in my life is to, um, you know, become a little bit more uh, pro uh, proactive as far as uh, trade ideas, uh, putting some things into uh, that I believe in, into expert advisors and such like that. But uh, I'm not going to change my, the, my way I am. That's why I'm calling it uh, Greg Mike FX because it's my, it's my way. It's my way. My way has been uh, built on uh, simplicity. It's been built on discipline. It's been built on, um, uh, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. It's been built on building a foundation that includes a mission statement, a game plan, rules, tools, and, and what, what is good and what is bad. Those are the things that you're going to get from me uh, going forward. So this isn't a commercial for me. But if you do want information or continue to have information, you can go to my website at Greg Mike FX. Click on, put in your email right there, and I'll keep you informed of what's going on. So let's uh, let's get into the meat and potatoes here. Thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity to have that little commercial, and also to I guess let let uh, listeners know where I stand. What do what do we know about the ECB and Draghi last week? Well, these are the headlines that. Um, 
I uh, outlined um, on the website, grabmymikefx.com. Uh, uh, and uh, some of the uh, highlights are in yellow and one little one in, in uh in green, but uh, the ECB, uh, you know, as a whole, sees rates at current levels for extended period of time. Gradual economic recovery is uh, is continuing. Unemployment still concern remains high. Downside risk to the economy uh, sounding a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, bi- uh, biased uh, toward the downside. Um, there, uh, I guess, uh, from an economic standpoint, inflation risk broadly balanced. However. Uh, I'm going to skip the uh, TLTRO here. Go down to effects of exchange rate is important for inflation. ECB looking at exchange rate with great attention. Then uh, they talked a little bit about the TLTRO program uh, will have an impact on growth and inflation. Uh, this is a uh, this program will uh, start in September. September, folks. So what is it? July now, beginning of July. Just had the July Fourth holiday here in the United States. So. August, September is where that's going to start. At that point, they're going to they're going to provide liquidity up to probably, according to the balance sheets uh, and the formula that they they are uh, putting out there for this um, funding program is uh, uh, would 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 inject about four hundred uh, uh, million do- billion dollars into the uh, econ- uh, or potentially into the economy. Uh, as far as extra liquidity liquidity goes, um, and uh, it's supposed to be used for um, supporting uh, local businesses. But uh, there's some questions as far as where that uh, money is going to go. It may go into uh, the bonds of uh, you know some some of the countries that higher yield and, and earn a interest rate or a a, a easy spread. The rate is going to stay set set at zero point two five percent. Or it's actually going to move up if the rates were to go up, but there's no uh, thought that rates will go up in the eurozone. In fact, the ECB has uh, said that they're going to remain on hold, and that might be extended through the year end. Hmm. Extended through the year end. Uh, after all, the uh, TLTR program is not going to take into effect, go into effect until September, and the ECB has said that it's going to it's going to take some while for them to figure out or see the impact of that program on the economy. So, guess what, folks? Probably no ECB from now to the end of the year, um, and uh, we're going to be uh, you know, tied to the data as it comes out uh, month by month, and then we're going to be tied to the the delay uh, from the uh, TLTRO program. Uh, and the impact that that may have on uh, lending to small businesses and trying and trying to kickstart the economy. That's the fundamental picture in the Eurozone. That's what we learned last week. That's what we learned last Thursday when uh, ECB came out with their interest rate decision and Draghi started to speak in his uh, press conference about what may or may not happen going forward. And then, then on Thursday, um, on that firework day, day before fireworks here in the United States, at least, uh, we had the U.S. employment report. And what do we get from the U.S. employment report? Well, we saw that unemployment rate dip down to uh, 6.1 percent. That was the lowest level uh, since, I think, uh, September of 2008. That's the lowest level since September 2008. You can see the graph here of how the market, the rate has steadily been declining from 9 percent to uh, we actually got uh, closer to 10% at the highs, uh, but uh, since uh, 2011, been coming down steady, steady, and we're at the lowest level since September 2008. Uh, they're expecting 6.3 as the rate rate uh, on uh, uh, last week, but uh, came in much better than expected. Non-farm payrolls, uh, they're expecting 215,000, came in at 288,000, much better than expected. Moreover, there were revisions to the prior month. Uh, we saw a private sector payroll also a, a, a increase in manufacturing jobs uh, go uh, grow higher than expected at sixteen thousand as well. So over uh, you know this part up here, much much better um, much better numbers coming out of that uh, that level. That should be bullish bullish for the dollar. So if the euro is neutral to more dovish, the U.S. is a little bit more bullish to uh, or or positive. As far as the economy, to being a little bit more, you know, probably moving closer toward a tightening. So that should be strong for the dollar, right? It should be strong for the dollar from a fundamental perspective. Now, there's some negatives in the uh, employment report. The labor force participation rate 
uh, stayed at the lowest level going back to February uh, 1978 at 62.8. Are those uh, are those people who uh, are participating in the labor force? Are they retiring? Um, it, you know, the demographics um, showing that, or are they discouraged workers? That's a big $24,000 question or $50,000 question or whatever you want to characterize it, it as um, that economists and analysts are struggling with. But it's becoming more and more, you know, acceptable. But uh, it does give you that feeling that even though unemployment is coming down 6.1, it's not all there, not all there. Um, this uh, next graph over here shows a little bit of that idea as well, uh, you know, a little bit of mixed report in the economy. And if you take a look at it, this shows the um, cumulative um, changes in employment in different industries, manufacturing, construction, mining, uh, et cetera, uh, at, at, uh, since the job depression, I call it the job, you know, well, I said recession here, but it really is job depression, uh, and, and to where we are uh, through uh, last Thursday's data. In other words, just putting it, putting it in, a, in this graphical form, form, form and, and making sense of it, Manufacturing jobs still minus 1.6 million jobs to the negative since the job depression started. Construction jobs still minus 1.46 million negative since the job um, depression started. So we haven't gotten back those jobs in the goods producing uh, sectors, manufacturing, construction. Mining just has 161. Um, that's the other uh, uh, section or component of the goods producing sec section. The rest is service jobs here. And you can see the service jobs are doing uh, better with, uh, but still some weakness uh, through here. Still some negative numbers, uh, trade and transportation, haven't gotten back all the jobs yet. Infra information, haven't gotten back all the jobs yet. Financial, haven't gotten back all the jobs yet. Where the jobs are being created are business and professional, uh, health, health uh, sector, uh, that's uh, the aging of the population and uh, also in leisure and hospitality, which is discretionary spending, which is good, good. But, you know, when when economy is really moving, all these sectors are on uh, on target now, now are, are and moving higher. Now, admittedly, last month was a, a shift, a shift. Why? Because all the sectors increased last month, with the exception of other services, uh, whatever that is. That's that's the, you know, the bucket for anything else. But um all the sectors increased, uh, including the trade transportation by 72,000, which, uh, which was the highest uh, sector that increased. Remember, they haven't made back all their jobs yet here. So we're seeing increased growth in that sector. Perhaps it's time for that sector to start adding jobs. Good gains in professional and business. You know, that, the, the, those can be uh, uh, good paying jobs. You know, here, here, here are nice paying jobs over here in manufacturing construction. We saw some gains in, in them as well. Manufacturing up 16,000, again, better than expectations. So we're seeing some good, good numbers here. Not so good here, but better here. So we're seeing a trajectory to the upside. Three-month average of non-farm payroll, 288,000. That's good news. Uh, 29,000 revisions for the prior months. Um, good. Uh, the the uh, moving average is at 272 for the three months. That is the highest since uh, March of 2012. And you can see the other things. Uh, duration of unemployment starting to come down. Uh, still not at the low levels of uh, lower levels that we had prior to the job depression, but working our way to, to there. A lot of talk about part-time employment and temporary workers uh, moving moved higher last month. Don't want to see a lot of uh, those uh, type, types of employees. Here's some other uh, uh, indications of the um, of the uh, temporary workers, how they have uh, uh, that they have uh, continued had a nice uh, or a trajectory to the upside uh, from September 2009. We've added uh, that was when the uh, job depression started, um, or we started to um, uh, recover, I should say. Uh, we've added uh, 9.685 million private sector jobs. Of that, 1.122 million is temporary jobs. That's 11.58 are temporary jobs. We want to see them full time. So that, again, gives it an, an indication of um, 
uh, you know, some sort of we some weakness in the economy. And this this is the demographics of different demographics, including uh, college degree, high school men, women, whites, um, African Americans, and uh, the uh, younger population, eighteen and twenty four year old. And uh, eighteen and twenty four year old. This is this group right here. Pro uh, back when the uh, job recession depression started. Uh, the uh, levels are still not back to those levels. And the same goes true for the other sectors through here. Uh, you get the overall trends of them. Haven't gotten back to where they were uh, prior to uh, the uh, the 2008 uh, job depression. So uh, th this is another indication why there's more room to go, but working in the right right direction. So overall, last month, our, our characterizing unemployment employment is being strong. So what do we have? We have ECB. Uh, strong or, or um, you know, maintaining a dovish stance, but probably on hold for a while. And the U.S. <coughs> uh, unemployment situation um, stronger, much stronger than expected. So I thought what I do now is uh, start to look at some of the graphs and take a look back in time, time and take and and look at the employment reports and the ECB interest rate decisions uh, that we've had since the beginning of the year and see. If there's any pattern in the days after the reports uh, characterized by these highlighted boxes here, uh, if there's any um, character, uh, any trends that we can determine from whether the data was strong or weak, whether the ECB moved or, or didn't move. And so if we go, if we go back to uh, January and take a look at the number, the number actually came in weaker. Remember, we had that weather effect in uh, January, February, and, and maybe a little bit into March as well. So um, in January, the number came in at 74,000. They're expecting 197,000. And what did we see the dollar do? What did we see the euro do? We saw the euro go down and the dollar go up over the next five uh, days days uh, of trading. So that kind of went in counter to what you were, uh, what the market, what you might expect. You might expect that a uh, um, weaker, weaker uh, employment report might send the euro higher and the dollar dollar lower. It didn't. The euro went to the downside here. Uh, what happened in February? Again, we had a weaker number. They're expecting 180,000. Came in at 113,000, weaker than expected. By this time, uh, the five days we saw the price ultimately move higher. We did go lower, however, initially. So we went to the, you know, like we did in January, we went to the downside first, which is counter to what we thought, but ended up the week higher. So it ended up finding itself and moving in what would be the most fundamentally expected uh, mo uh, uh, direction. In the month of uh, March, uh, what do we see? We saw a number come in at 175,000 versus 149,000. This was stronger than expected and what would you expect the dollar to do there on a stronger than expected number you'd expect the dollar the euro to go down the dollar to go up and indeed it did over the first two days but we ended up uh, moving higher uh, at the end of the week and in fact moved up the new new highs for the year at that point um, af uh, by the time uh, Friday came along the following week so uh, that that probably moved in the in the in a direction that was opposite what we thought and then uh, you know moving on forward uh, we had a, uh, a, a as expected number here and we saw the euro go higher the dollar go lower we saw a stronger than expected uh, number here and we saw actually the euro move to the downside but it wasn't until the market went up and made new highs here again so very similar to what we saw um uh uh here i guess uh where where the um uh, well, well, in this, where was it? Back here, where we saw the price move down and then move to the upside in, on a weaker number. In this case, we went higher, made new highs, and then, then plummeted by the end of the week to the downside here. So a bit of a confusion, uh, confusion by the market uh, here and, and, you know, kind of not doing what you'd expect it to do. We're trying to build a pattern here to try to see what we can expect going forward, what my mindset is going forward. And then we take a look at the, um, not the, this month, but the last month in the in the month of June, uh, the number came in right as expected, 217 versus 215. Uh, we saw the euro move uh, down. 
down. We also saw the ECB stimulate. Uh, we saw them uh, do the, uh, you know, lower the rates. We saw them uh, uh, announce the uh, TLTR or, or TLTRO program. Uh, and so you would expect that the euro would go down, the dollar would go up, and indeed that is uh, what it did. It, did, it moved uh, to the down, downside here. Here, so uh, you'd expect, but uh, since that time, uh, since around the middle of the month, after that first week of trading, the market moved higher, higher, and it even moved above the 200. Now we have a stronger number. And what have we seen uh, on uh, Thursday? We saw uh, the uh, move, the market move to the downside. Seeing some follow through on uh, Friday's trade, and today well, we'll look at today's uh, trade in just a second. So, what can we say about the these movements going forward? As we head into this new week, what can we say that the past has showed us um, about what we can expect for the future? And quite frankly, it's random. There's nothing much there. I wouldn't rely on it. I wouldn't say that because the number was stronger that the euro is going to go down, the dollar is going to go higher, or that the dollar is going to go higher against uh, many, many of the other currency pairs as well. I'm sure we saw a similar type of reaction in some of the other currency pairs. So what does that um, what does that say that we need to do? Well, um, what is my mindset? This gets to my mindset for trading this week. So understanding that well, it doesn't really have an impact. I have to now determine. I want you to get into my mind. I have to determine what am I going to start to look at that might determine or help determine where the market may be going uh, forward. Well. You know, I do have a bias that the dollar gets stronger. Why? Because the the number was stronger. The ECB is still, you know, on an easing track or likely to remain unchanged for a while. And, and if anything, I think Goldman Sachs came out today and said that they expect that um, rates in the U.S. might go up earlier than expected. And that, we know, is a formula for a stronger currency. Higher rates we saw in New Zealand. Uh, New, Z New Zealand dollar is an example in recent time, there's been a country that's been raising rates, and what has New Zealand dollar been doing generally moving to the upside? And so if the U.S. or uh, or maybe the U.K. are going to start to raise their rates uh, sooner rather than later, that's going to be bullish for their currency. Uh, we'll take a look at the pound sterling a little bit later as well. So um, from a fundamental perspective, though, what do we have this week? You know, Because we're talking about this week, what's my mindset? Are we going to have a calm? Are we going to have a storm this week? And unfortunately, when we take a look at the uh, market calendar this week, and this too is on our website at uh, Greg Mike FX, um, you, the the calendar as far as the U.S. data goes, these are the the major releases for each of the calendar days. We have the J U.S. Jolts job opening report uh, coming out tomorrow, and uh, you know, a higher amount of job openings is positive, and that's what we've been seeing here. We already know that from the unemployment report, however, so it's not going to be anything new as far as data goes. We also have the unemployment claims, and that's it. That's it for the U.S. There's nothing else uh, coming out worthy of printing on this page here. We do have the minutes of the meeting coming out. Uh, uh, I think that's on Wednesday, or, um, and we have some uh, Fed speakers uh, speaking as well. Um, those may be uh, really the highlights from, a, uh, from an economic uh, release slash event type of, uh, type of um uh, you know what we can focus on from that perspective. Uh, German industrial production already came out today, weaker than expected. Um, and as far as the Europe Europe goes, not much in the way of economic data come coming out as well. In the UK, we have visible you know trade trade deficit. This uh, CPI coming out on Friday in Germany is a, is a final. It's not it's not even the you know an estimate that, or for or it's not the uh, you know current number. It's just a, a revision to what was already preliminary. It's not supposed to be different than what uh, they originally uh, uh, they projected. So no real change there. We have China CPI, some Australian news coming out. We had Canada news come out today, and the building permits uh, came out much stronger than expected. Maybe we'll look at that a little bit later. later. Um, uh, so not much going on in the calendar this week. So we don't really have a fundamental reason or reasons other than what we know from the past uh, to make any sort of uh, uh, judgment uh, judgment on the market uh, going forward this week, so we're we're kind of hitting uh, dead ends here. We have random action from uh, the history of the week 
after non-farm payrolls. It can go up, it can go down. We're having fundamental news that is, um, well, not much news at all. So we have to go rely on the old reliable, the technicals. And look at the technicals, and we've got to look for clues in the market. And for me, particular, uh, for me uh, specifically, I have a disciplined and I think logical way of looking at the market for trading opportunities. I try to keep things simple. I try to keep things um, visual. I try to use our, our human senses as much as I can, um, in particular vision and, 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 uh, and, and, and what is uh, you know, logical for, for, for uh, traders. Um, and so I use uh, just three simple uh, technical tools. I use trend lines, moving average, and Fibonacci retracements. And I found through the years, through my 28 years, that these tools end up, end up giving you um, as good a chance as anyone else in figuring out the trends or which way the market is going to go, um, even in those random times when the market doesn't, doesn't necessarily do what you think it should do. Um, you can rely on the technicals to kind of tell you the picture, tell you the story, figure out where uh, the, the uh, levels are and what the bias is for your trading. And what I like to try to do is I take those tools and I try to trade near what I call borderlines defined by these tools. And by doing so, it allows me to define and limit risk. And so uh, with an uh, uncertain week ahead, with not much going on, uh, I'm going to start to look at what the uh, charts are telling me and try to define and limit risk against certain technical levels. So what does that mean on a chart? Well, if you take a look at the dollar versus yen just in, in the past and take a look at a trend line here and take a look at a trend line here and take a look at the 200. Uh, this is an hourly chart here. So 200 hour moving average. Take a look at the 100 hour moving average here. And if um, you... Um, if you look at the, um, uh, th this area right here, what do we know? We know that the market held against resistance against uh, point number six here. This was a borderline level that if you were to sell against, you would have had a nice little tra trade going on to the downside. What would be your risk if we moved above that level? So this is when I talk about borderline levels or levels that, or technical levels that I'm looking for, it's number six. It's also the 100 and 200 bar moving average here. When on the hourly chart, the market moves below those two moving averages and the market stays below those levels. It's very similar to what here, except it's a moving averages here. And so once again, if it, or, or um, if, if the stop on this cell right here or uh, are on a cell uh, right here is right here, so you're risking that amount, the, this, the, uh, the stop on a trade in this area right here might be a move above uh, these highs right here. Um, that way, uh, at that point, the market's back above the 100 and 200 hour moving average. And it's uh, above the previous uh, highs on this day and this day, and we've spiked to the upside, moved down, and then we use that level as a, as a level. So risk can be defined and risk can be limited against those levels. When we move below the bottom trend line right here, uh, what does the market do? It moves lower, and we even get a second chance to sell against our 100 and 200 bar moving average against the underside of this trend line right here. And so this area right here uh, is where I want to trade. I want to trade in this area or up here against this uh, trend line right here. It makes sense. So me as a trader, you as a trader should look for these simple visual levels where you can lean against and trade, and that's uh, one example on the dollar versus yen. Let's take a look at the euro versus U.S. dollar. Not currently, but back in time uh, where the market was making its um, high high at the beginning of the month of uh, July. Uh, what do we uh, run into here? Well, we had a, uh, a trend line here connecting a couple points. You can put a parallel trend line on the top right here, and we held it at 2, and we held it at 3. We, we moved above the 38.2, which is bullish here. This is of this move to the downside here. But what couldn't the market do at three? It couldn't get and stay above that level. We couldn't get to the next target up here at the 100-day moving average, which is always the blue line right here. And what did the market ultimately do? On this day, we stayed in between the trend line and the 200-day moving average, which is the green line right here. And on, this, on the next day, we fell below the green line, and that was the Start of the move to the downside prior to the unemployment report. This is the unemployment report 
So if you as a trader would have, uh, you know, tried selling here, sold back when we moved back below 38.2 with a stop up here, or even sold on the break of the 200 hour moving average on this day, you, you may have been able to sit through the unemployment report with a short position and a stop above the 200 day moving average or the 38.2 and benefited from that stronger report to the downside. So this is a borderline level. This is a borderline level. This is a borderline level right here. All these levels are borderline levels that you as a trader can lean against and hope that the market goes in your way. Did I or anyone else know that the, the number would be 288,000? Um, you know, some people would say, well, I, get, I, I knew it was going to be stronger. Well, why weren't the estimates stronger than what they came in at uh, 215,000 prior? That's so I always question myself and always wonder, you know, um, you know, hindsight is, uh, is 2020 from a fundamental perspective. But if, if everyone thought that the number would be so strong, why weren't the estimates so strong? So anyway, but, uh, you know, so the so the you know, my point, my point is, is that we as we as traders really don't know what the fundamentals are going to be. The only thing that we do know is that we can define our risk and limit our risk against these levels of hope that the market does what we think it should do from a technical perspective. And oftentimes that technical perspective, um, you know, if it moves your way, gets supported by the story, by the fundamentals. But it really is, it all started right here against the trend line. It all started right here when we moved back below the 200 day moving average. Risk can be defined against these levels. Risk can be limited against those levels. So you're kind of protected, aren't you? You're protected, and that what that is what's going to determine a a, a good trader and a bad bad trader. Is the, the 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 unsuccessful trader tends not to have that protection. Tends not to focus on risk as much as I do. That's what you have to do: focus on risk. Well, let's take a look at the uh, dollar versus Canada. This is just uh, this morning's uh, chart, and I don't know where it stands right now. We'll take a look at it in, in uh, just a second. Uh, but the uh, market came below. The um, or uh, or moved above uh, uh, came up to this uh, level right here one two three on the top side trend line right here and trade this is uh, before the economic data this morning and if you were to trade it against that borderline level here uh, with the stop above what the two hundred hour moving average this is an hourly chart right here when was the last time the price was above the two hundred hour moving average all or closed above all the way back here on June tenth so nearly a month. We've been below the 200-hour moving average. So that's a pretty key level to lean against um, if you have the opportunity to. And if you add the, the uh, trend line there, that's what traders came in. They sold against that level. And the uh, building permits came in at, uh, much stronger than expected. The market moved lower. We fell back below the 100-hour moving average, which we went above once and failed, went above twice and failed, went above three times now and failed. Um, don't know where the price is uh, right now, but um, if we're below that uh, 100 uh, hour moving average around the uh, 48 level, let me see here. Uh, yeah, we're much higher. 106, what, 74? No, 106.73. So uh, the Dollar Canada uh, did it did a a, a key um, or a reversal there in the uh, in the market. It looks like. Got that right. Indeed, it does, and we'll take a look at that hourly chart in just a se just a second. I don't want to switch off of here, but uh, we moved up back above this hundred bar moving average. We saw the market uh, squeeze back to the upside. We're back above the two hundred now as well. So, although the, as though you had a nice little short through here against the borderline level, uh, this is one of those trades that didn't follow through on the downside. So when, when the market failed on the move to the downside, you probably got back out. Back out. You didn't want to see the price move above the 106.48 level the market moved on. All right. Borderline levels. So what do we got uh, this week? And um, you know, we're, you know, let's uh, take let's start to dig down uh, into the euro versus US dollar, and we'll take a look at some of the other currency pairs at the end and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, the current range uh, for the euro right before I came in was only about 27 pips. I looked at this. Uh, I did this last week, uh, last month as well, by uh, you know taking a look at the ranges. Uh, if you were in the webinar uh, last last month, and the euro dollar range in trading here today is is a uh, modest 27 pips. 
The average over the last 22 trading days have been to about 60 pips. So what does that tell you about today's trading? It tells you that the range is very narrow and that we have a possibility of extending that trading range even now as we head toward the London flows. I, my, my guess is that we're going to move either make new highs or going to make new lows in the euro by the time the day is up. So that's one little clue that we take a look at. The other thing I want to take a look at now that we're halfway through the year, we're kind of add to the equation for the euro is this is that the euro high to low trading range for the year is only 517 pips only 517 pips from the low to the high for the trading year now we're halfway through the year and we have another half to go for the year but like this uh, prior prior chart where the range is narrow compared to what the average is and when I see a narrow trading range, I'm anticipating a movement outside of that trading range. Just like that, you can apply that to longer periods. And if we look at the range for the year, 517 pips, it is more than half. It is, uh, you know, it is more than half or, or it, it is it is only um, one half. Let's just say a half of what the most narrow trading range for the euro on a calendar year has been in its history going back to 1999. So what does that say to you? What does that say to me? What does that, that says to me that we have the possibility that the, or the good probability that the range is going to be extended either to the upside or to the downside. So that the low is going to be taken out or the high is going to be taken out. All right. So, that idea about looking at the ranges intraday or in, in, within a day can be extended to looking at the ranges over a time period, like a year, and making a judgment that I doubt that we're going to have half the trading range, even with the volatility being so down that it has been in this year's trading. So with that, with that framework in place, Let's now go to our charts and take a look at the euro and get into my mind what I'm thinking about the euro in trading this week. In, in this week. So um, now I assume that you cannot see my charts now. Can you see my charts? Chart, or do you still, still see the PowerPoint? Do you see a chart? Okay, good. All right, well, this is the uh, euro versus uh, US dollar. And I want to I want to take a look at this uh, pair uh, from a technical perspective, and you know see you know see see if we can come to some idea as far as uh, where where risk is where where a trade might be where where might this uh, pair go what or what clues do we need to see from this pair in order to you know, see if the trend can continue. One of the things that we, we know today is that the range is very narrow. We only have a 27 pip trading range in uh, trading here today. Well, let's stop right there. Let's, or, or let's not look at that first. Let's take a look at the, uh, the uh, daily chart. And we'll start looking at the daily chart. Then we'll look at the hourly chart. We'll look at the five minute chart and make some sort of judgment as far as our trading. What we know from from you know the pre prior charts was was what that the euro can go up it can go down after the employment report it doesn't matter if the number is stronger it doesn't matter if the number is weaker we saw the market move in the opposite direction from what we thought from a fundamental standpoint and then ultimately move in the directional bias that we expected in other in other instances so what do we know we know the employment report is much stronger so what would you expect from the euro we expect the euro to go down the dollar to go up and indeed, uh, and we also know that the range uh, for the year is very narrow. And so when I look at this daily chart right here, and I go back to the uh, beginning of the year, which uh, takes me uh, to right here, okay? This is our low for the year. Our low for the year came in at 134.76. Our high for the year came in at 139.90. So with the understanding that I, I expect the range to be extended this year, what does this daily chart tell me from a technical perspective? Are we going to? Are we more inclined to, or more, we have a better chance of moving to the downside or moving to the upside? Are we a better chance of taking out the 139.92 level or the downside at 134.76? Uh, 
And I think 10 out of 10 people uh, would say that the, uh, the expectations are to take out the lows. So we have that going for us um, that, or I, I, in my mind, my mindset, I'm thinking we're going to take out the lows between now, you know, sometime between now and the end of the year. Now, what is our bias now? What bias do we have from a technical perspective in the euro versus U.S. dollar now, giving our tools that we have in place that I use? This is a 200-day moving average. Are we below the 200-day moving average? And the answer is yes. So that's bearish. As long as the price is below the 200-day moving average, it's bearish. This is a trend line. This is a parallel channel trend line here. Did we break below the bottom trend line here? And the answer is yes. So is that bullish or bearish? That's bearish. So we're below the trend line. We're below the 200. We're, we're also below the 100-day moving average. And note here, when the market fell below the 100-day moving average, do we ever get back above that 100-day moving average? And the answer is no. So the market has, has been trading more bearishly here or is more bearish now. Now, we did move back above the 200 here. We moved back above the 200 here. But the market did find resistance against the 38.2 on the retracement here and sold off against that level. So off the daily chart, um, what would you expect? I would expect that the bias is to the downside here and that we keep the door open for a move down through the 134.76 level. That would be my expectations for the uh, off the daily chart here. All right. Where might that um, that idea um, be disproved? And one of the levels would be uh, uh, if the market moved back above this trend line, this broken trend line, or above the 200-day moving average. If we were to move back above e either of these levels right here, someone from a technical perspective, that that would be more bullish. The price is back above the trend line. It failed on the, on the move below the trend line. So right off the bat this week, uh, this uh, trend line comes in around the 136.30. I probably don't want to see the price move above the 136.30 level. And I probably don't want to, uh, if I want to, um, uh, you know, increase my risk, I probably wouldn't want to see it move above the 136.73 level. That's our 200-day moving average. If it goes above those levels, that's more bullish. That's more bullish for the euro versus U.S. dollar. And let's take a look at the hourly chart and see what that's telling us using our tools. And the hourly chart is mo used more by intermediate term traders. So traders who are looking for swing lows and swing highs. And like the, uh, like the daily chart here, what, what, did we, what do we do similar to what we saw on the daily chart? Well, on the daily chart, remember, we moved below the 100-day moving average here, and we found resistance there. Let's go to the hourly chart. We move below the 100-hour moving average, and what do we do? We found resistance against the 100-hour moving average here. Market moved lower. We also went below a trend line here, same thing that we did on the, uh, on the daily chart. In fact, it's the same trend line. So we went through up below a trend line. So we were, went, we were going below and staying below key levels on the hourly chart as well. So that, too, is more bearish here. We're below the trend line. We're below the 100-bar 100, the 100 moving average. We're below the 200-hour moving average, below the trend line. So that's more negative, right? Now, um, w there, there are some things intraday here which are a little bit concern concerning for the downside here. Just because we break below the trend line doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to continue forever and ever. We have other targets along the way that we need that we target on the way on our journey lower. And one of the targets that we hit today was this low. Uh, this is uh, not the low from uh, last week, but and I'm not sure it was low from the week week prior, but it was a spike low here where the market fell below the 100 and 200 bar moving average. Should have been more negative here but found support probably against this low right here. So we're, we're finding some support against this floor. We can call this a floor. There's a few pips that separate this from this from this, but these two line up very nicely right here. So one, two, the last three times the market went down toward the 135.75 level, the market found some support. And so traders who are short through, Friday, through Thursday's number are buying it down here. 
Now, does that necessarily mean that the, the market is now bullish? Well, it's bullish intraday. Bullish intraday. But in order to turn this market around on the hourly chart, what do we need to do? We need to get back above this trend line, back above the 100 and 200 bar moving average. And I put a Fibonacci retracement of the uh, last move to the downside and back above the 38.2. So this area right here becomes a resistance area for the pair, understanding that probably over time this this 100 bar moving area is going to catch up to this price, this area right here. So that's going to be in play here as well. So this is the area this week where I would be looking for sellers against that level and rotation back to the downside from that, that, from that level. Okay. Uh, how can I increase my resolution? Plus S, what does that do? Uh, mm, uh, can, if, can anyone else uh, see that? No, uh, not you, Greg. The guy's watching. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Um, so, um, so from from the euro's uh, perspective, as long as the price can on the hourly chart and the intermediate trend, as long as the price can remain below this level, the bias remains to the downside. So we're bearish on the daily chart. We're bearish on the hourly chart. Now let's take a look at the five minute chart. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're bearish on the hourly chart, but we do have a we do have a level that we have to get through on the downside right here on the hourly chart. We need to get below the one thirty five seventy five level, don't we, this week? So um, now let's look at the five-minute chart and see what that five and what that uh, chart is uh, telling us. And um, off the off the five-minute chart, we have the same tools in here: the 100-bar moving average, the 200-bar moving average, and trend lines and Fibonacci retracements as well. Uh, we also have uh, the horizontal line here coming across at around the 136 level, and I have a line coming across here at 135.83. I failed to talk about that level, but I'll talk, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But just looking on the five-minute chart, what do we see uh, here? Well, we see the price moving below the 100-bar moving average and coming down to trend line support. The market couldn't get below that level at the low right here, which also happened to be the low right here. And so, there, so now we're starting to see why the price bottomed at this level. We had support against this trend line. And we had support against this low right here. These are two different things. This is a trend line right here. This is that, that right there. So traders on a shorter term chart found a reason to buy right here. Risk can be defined or risk can be limited. And they did. If the market went below that level, we'd probably see the market moving sharply to the downside or further to the downside. But it didn't. It moves, moved back above. And what have, we, what have we done over the last four or five or six hours? Stayed above that 100 bar moving average. What have we done on the top side? Stay below the 136 level. So we have a you know a, a, you know one of these battles that in a non-trending type day that is going to be determined on a break above the 136 level or a break back below the 100 and 200 bar moving average in that. So we've now read you know we we've taken our focus from a daily chart which has this wide area right here and read and, and defined it uh, more you know on a wide wide perspective off the hourly chart through here and here. And now go to the five-minute chart, and we have we've narrowed it down even further to here and here. The difference between this is 88. The difference, and and this is this is 12 pips. So we have this battle going on between the support down here and resistance up here. Is the bias on the five-minute chart a little bit uh, positive? Yes, we've held above the 100, 100 and 200 bar moving average now for the whole New York session. So there is there is a, a a desire to move higher here, and uh, but where would we expect to see some sellers up up above, probably around the 08 level, around the 19 level, and uh, how does that uh, compare to this level right here? This level is around the 17 level right here. So you see this uh, 19 level, which is a 50% retrace for this move to the downside. I would expect that if the market moves higher, that we'd see nice sellers up here and keep the buys to the downside here in the euro. Right now, uh, the, alternatively, you as a trader have an option option to um, wait until the market breaks below this level or sell against the 136 level. 
hopefully the market breaks to the downside and go go lower. Overall, I'm more bearish on on the euro versus U.S. dollar, but honestly, I have no position position right now. If the you know I uh, uh, squared up a short, if the market went below these levels, I'd be more more uh, concerned, or, or, or I would I would look to add or get in the position again if it fell below these levels. Um, and then if we need to get below the 75 level on the downside, push this market further to the downside. Alternatively, I'm looking to sell sell up here against the 136.19 level. It was a there was a high correction after the unemployment report. It's 50% retracement of this move to the downside, and it's against the underside of the trend line here off the hourly chart around that 19 level near the 38.2% retracement of this, and the 100 bar moving average coming back to the downside there as well. So this is what you have to do to anticipate a trade. Right now, a little bit more bullish or moving. Um, moving a little bit uh, to the upside. Uh, let's take a quick look at the uh, some of our other currency pairs here. If you do have a currency pair you want to take a look at, uh, please put it in here. We have a few more minutes uh, uh, to go, but I'll take a look at them and, them, and uh, as this week uh, starts and give you my uh, perception of them, uh, those uh, currency pairs. The sterling versus U.S. dollar off the weekly chart. You have to go to the weekly chart and look back in time. We're at the highest level since 2008. We moved above the 170.41 level, which is a high high from 2009. As long as the price remains above the 170.41 level, the longer term perspective is bullish. What does the daily chart uh, show? I mean, the really long term perspective is bullish. What is the daily chart showing? It's showing that last week we went and made new highs, and and uh, um, but. Uh, that uh, move to the upside took out this uh, this uh, trend line where we had one, two, three different points. We took it out here. We stayed above that level. We had the unemployment report. Market moved down and rallied to the upside. Made new highs. But today, where are we back down? We're back down below the 171.32. So for me, the pound versus U.S. dollar is looking a little bit tired. It's looking like it might, on the daily chart, might have reached a high here. If the market moves above the 171.31 level, I'd be a little bit more cautious, however, um, after all the trend is to the upside. So any shorts up here probably covered if the market moves above the 31 level. You see this uh, red, uh, this blue line right here? That also is a reminder, a reminder to me that the 100-hour moving average is in play up here at the 40, not 49 level. So here's our 30 um Here's our level right here. This what is this? This comes at 31. Here's that 31 level right here. And for the most part, the market fell below that 31 level and stayed below that level. If we were to, if I were to uh, sell the uh, pound versus US dollar, you know, on the hunch that we reached the high, we couldn't, we couldn't develop any momentum above that level. This would be our risk area for this uh, pair. We probably wouldn't want to see the price move back above that level, back above this area right here. And it may be even, you know, right here, because if we get back above this trend line right here, that's probably not going to be good. Good, And also the 50 percent of this move to the downside. We're not seeing a lot of momentum to the downside. We're just kind of guessing that the price highs up here are running out of steam below the 100. Where do we find support here today? Right against the, the parallel uh, trend line right here. So we're in this channel right here. So there's, the, you know, like the euro, there's a little bit, a little, little bit of uh, bearishness. There's a little bit of uh, bullishness uh, here in this chart right now or in this uh, currency pair. We need to get below this level right here. We need to get below the 38.2. We need to get below those levels in order to confirm, and the, and the 100 bar moving average here, or 200 bar moving average here, in order to confirm the downside. When the market moves higher and then consolidates in a range over five or so trading days, it does get, there's a lot of levels that the market has to get through. And I wrote about this on our blog today or on the commentary today. You need to get below these, these little levels here. We need to get below this trend line. We need to get below this double bottom. We need to get below the 38.2 and the 200 bar moving average. By the same token, you can also say, well, that's my bet. I think we're going to go back below that level. Just don't go above this level. So risk can be defined or risk can be limited. You're looking for the break one way or the other. Um, let's uh, look at the um, 
I'm a little bit more uh, bearish on the, on the on the pound sterling, by the way, just by the virtue of the fact that we're at these highs right here. The market's been marching to the upside, and we fell below this level right here. But if the market does go above that 31 level, I'm I'm going to lose uh, interest because I, I still I still support the trend. I just don't want to support it too much too much. <laughs> Um, and the trend is to the upside. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, dollar versus yen. The dollar versus yen uh, here has uh, uh, is trading in between what I call the gold post. It's a daily chart. This 100-day moving average. It's a 200-day moving average. See this trend line here? One, two, three different points right here. We fell below the trend line, fell below 200 here. Market should have gone lower. What would be the next uh, target here? These lows right here, low, low. Uh, we fell below those levels on this day right here. The market should have gone lower here. It didn't. It started to rally back to the upside. So this is a, this is a, uh, we need to get below the 100 and 200 bar moving average. And we need to get below this area right here, here again. But right now we are, um, we are in between the 100 and 200 bar moving averages. Uh, and like, some, you know, this, this is basically my trade, trade for the week is look for a break to the upside. The other interesting thing about the dollar versus yen, folks, is that like the euro versus US dollar, the uh, dollar versus yen is in a very narrow trading range for the year. Um, 471 pips from this high to this low right here. And you can see that it's gotten even more consolidated here. So I am looking for a break one way or the other here for this uh, currency pair going forward. Look for, uh, if we break through the, the 200, if we break through this trend line, look for further momentum through here, through here. And then we could head on down toward the um, 90, uh, 9984 level. It's the next key target on the downside. It comes off of a weekly chart, 50% retracement. It's right here of a longer term move down here. 9984, just write that down on your piece of paper. That's the downside. That's the downside objective uh, for the time, uh, you know, on any sort of breakdown here. We'll be down toward that 99.84 and a half level. If the market should break to the upside, we can just as easily head up to this high right here and this trend line right here and break above that level. And that opens up the door for a move toward the 104.10 level. We're, uh, we're a couple months away from the uh, sales tax increase um, in the, um, uh, the sales tax uh, increase um, in the, uh, In, uh, in Japan. And so the market's going to be looking for the effects of that increase uh, going forward. All right. Any other currency pairs you want to take a look at before I end this? Can you just uh, zoom in the chart? You can right click on the screen, choose a size. Um, we're going to have to go through that uh, after, the, after the event here, I guess. All right. Um, Anyway, taking a look at uh, some of the, some of the major currency pairs and why. Uh, let's take a look at that dollar Canada real quickly uh, before we uh, call it call a day. We were looking at this uh, trend line right here. Sellers against that level force the market to the downside. Dollar Canada is one of those currency pairs that if you get bullish economic data and the market doesn't go lower on that data, um, any sort of move back above the uh, resistance level uh, starts to um, uh, leads to a, a big move to the upside. And things get started crazy, so we started to move back above that level. All right, uh, let's uh, call it a day here. I want to thank everybody for uh, coming in uh, here today. I uh, hope you learned uh, something uh, about um, about the about the market. I think uh, characterize you know we can characterize the market as um, uh, you know from a historical standpoint of being one that after the important report after the ECB type of me uh, meetings uh, doesn't necessarily do what you think it should do. Uh, the dollar does, the dollar does the same thing. We're in this, uh, this, uh, kind of a quagmire here where the market market is having trouble getting out of its way. What we can say, however, is that ranges are very narrow, uh, particularly in the Euro and the, and the dollar versus yen for the year. And so we're still looking for a break either to the upside or to the downside. And we should, should be, uh, follow through with uh, bigger moves as a result. All right, I want to thank everybody for uh, uh, coming in here. Have a great day. Good fortune with your trading. Visit me at uh, Greg Mike FX and um, good fortune with your trading. Bye bye now.